goodness and your mercy. I thank you, Lord God, and I pray in advance, Father, that your words fill my mouth and flow from my heart, out of the abundance of my heart, to speak about your truth, to speak about your covenant promises, Lord. Lord God, I am overwhelmed every day by your covenant promises, Lord. And that's, Lord, what I'm declaring today and want to remind your people about is what you purchased for us. The fullness of salvation is not just when we leave here to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but it's to walk in the blessings that God has provided through the work of the cross. And in the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. 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 You give God the glory. Brothers and sisters, the name of the message tonight is called Overwhelmed by God's Covenant Promises. Overwhelmed by God's, by God's Covenant Promises, Part 3. Overwhelmed by God's Covenant Promises, Part 3. And I'd like for you to open your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 21 and 32. And then we put a marker to also go to Romans 4, verses 7 through 16. And also put a marker for Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 through 29. And when you get there, say amen. Father God, I just thank you again, Lord, that you will continue to guide us through your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Lord, that in faith we do come to a place of truly walking by and in faith and not by sight. That, Lord God, we, this day, March the 9th, 2022, decree and declare that it shall come to pass. And that's the promises that God has decreed, that they will come to pass in my life, in their life, as we hearken unto his word, doubting it not. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. The Word of God says in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21, and then, then I want you to also look at 32. It says that something happened when, you know, God was speaking, spoke to Moses and told Moses about the promised land, the people about the promised land. He had laid it all out, the covenant promises of God. That's what it, it represented, the promised land. For them uh, physically, but for us spiritually, and now because we have better better promises, with a better covenant means we have it spiritually and physically. They looked at it physically, but we see it spiritually, and because it's spiritual, it also becomes physical because we are of Abraham's promised seed, amen? Because through Christ Jesus, we have inherited that. So the Word of God says this, but I want you to understand something. A lot of people, especially in today's age, they don't seem to place much emphasis on faith. And without faith, you, you cannot even believe in your salvation. Without faith, you can't stand against the enemy. Without faith, you can't claim peace. You can't claim healing. You can't, and it does no good to claim healing if you can't claim anything else. The whole word is the whole word. The whole blessing of God is to be whole. And I declare to you all that God's word, God's covenant promise affects not only you spiritually, but it affects your mind, your emotions, and your body. It is to address every part of your life. Amen? The word of God. But there's something that happened, and it happened very much to them as it is happening to us today. It says here in verse 21, Behold, the Lord thy God had set thee a land before thee. He's talking about the promised land. And God gave them a commandment. Brother, watch He said, go up and look at it. He said, go up and possess it. Own it. As the Lord God of thy fathers had said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. But then it says something in verse 32 that really is a sounder for us all. It says, Yet in this thing you did not believe the Lord your God. Let us think in a moment. 
Yet in this thing, now you can read the whole dialogue, but the most important factor is what he said, Behold, the Lord God had set the land before thee, talking about the promised land, go up and possess it. He says, go up and inhabit it, is what he's talk, talking about. Go up and inhabit it. As the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee, fear not, neither be discouraged. But then in verse 32, it lays the burden down, the problem where it, it may be found is not in God's promises. It's in what happened next. It says this, yet in this thing you do not believe the Lord your God. Church, covenant promises is the platform I'm reminding us about today. It's the faith alive in Christ and what he has done and said. But it's got to be walked in faith. It's got to be walked out in genuine faith. Because it is the only vehicle that gets us there and keeps us there. It's faith. I'm, I'm listen. You know what really caused me to stop and think about this is because throughout the Bible it's always been the same way. Even when when I was talking about Sunday, when I shared with you when Christ was in the boat and he was asleep, and the waves rolls up and then the storm rolls up. And they went, they, they were all outside of themselves. They were afraid and everything. Yet Christ was right there. And they said, don't you care that we perish? Because the water was inside the boat and all that. And, and he was sleeping. Mm -hmm. But what I want you to hear is what I tried to make you hear Sunday. I don't know if you paid attention to it or not. But he didn't say you of no faith. He said you of little faith. See, I'm declaring unto you, I'm not saying that you don't have faith, but I'm saying there's different levels of faith that need to be worked in you, and only you can do it. See, Jesus didn't tell them that they didn't have any faith. He said, ye of little faith. And right now, there's a lot of water trying to get in our boat, for one reason or another. And I believe the Holy Spirit is turning to us and saying, oh, ye of little faith. Huh? Where's your faith? He didn't condemn us for not having faith. He said, oh ye a little faith. See, faith doesn't grow unless it's cultivated. Faith doesn't grow, and you've heard it before, unless it's used. But I find the more that we're blessed sometimes, we let the blessings interfere with our faith. We start to coast more so than cultivate. And it is the only vehicle that keeps us in the promised land, the covenant promises of God. And the key to that is it must be fed daily by his word, heard and spoken. Go to Romans 1.16 for me. Keep your other notes for the other readings, for there's a reason for all that. Romans 1.16 and 17. Romans 1.16, the word of God says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, and also to whom? To the what? To the Greek. In other words, it's for everyone that believes, right? So the word of God says, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from what? From faith to what? Faith. Now listen. Then the next thing it says, as what? It is written, what? The just shall live by what? Faith. See, it's not once and done thing when things are tough. No, oh, it's a daily lifestyle. We hear the same point made throughout the Bible as, as you hear in Romans, one of the other readings we have, Romans 7 through 16. Go there for me. Romans 7, excuse me, Romans 4, 7 through 16. And I use this constantly because I see so much there. I could just take that wrong, that wrong, that one statement there, that one group of scriptures and build a whole message on it. But there's far more than that. 
The Word of God says, and I'm going to read it to you, Romans chapter 4, verses 7 through, what did I tell you? 16. The Word of God says here, listen, saying, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Are we in together here? Amen. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now listen, verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon, and I want you to hear it, that's why I'm going to read it slow. Blessedness then upon the circumcision only. He's asking a question. Or upon the uncircumcision also. He's talking about the law, the old covenant, or the new covenant, Greek and Jew. That's what he's talking about. Now watch what he says here. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for what? Listen. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision? Or in uncircumcision? You see, it's, he, this covenant came to him before he was circumcised. Mm -hmm. So it was before the law. Because it was by faith. But look how it qualifies both. That's why he said the Jew and the Greek. But look what he says. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? He says, not in circumcision, but in, but in uncircumcision. He's talking about faith. And he received the sign of circumcision. So faith had to come there first, right? And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. The circumcision that he received just identified what he already had before that, the law, before the law. That he might be the father of what? All men that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which had been yet uncircumcised. One new man is what he's talking about. For the promise that he should be, what? The heir of the world was not to Abraham. Are you with me so far? Or to his seed through what? The law. the law. But through the righteousness of what? Faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith, listen, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now to understand where I'm going with this, let's go to the next reading I asked you to go to. In, uh, Galatians chapter 3, I think it was, 21 through 29. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And all that I'm reading to you right now, it is speaking about covenant promises. And they are two-parted. What do you mean two-parted, Pastor? As I said earlier, between God and God Himself. With us as the recipients in faith walked in. Y'all understand what I'm talking about. See, that's the same thing. Remember when Abram was Abram and God made a covenant with him and he told Abram to go ahead and get different doves and different things to cut up and he cut them all up and then there was a blood in between there and we know that the a smoking furnace came in. Furnace came in and actually walked through there or sealed the covenant. And we know that in the midst of that, we saw 
Where Abraham, if you read him, Abram, he says he fell asleep. Mm -hmm. So the covenant was made with God and himself. Abraham being the recipient of it. And when Abram woke up, he was in terror, he was in fear. Because what he saw was a bunch of fall trying to take away the body parts of the, the things that represented the covenant. He had to drive the falls away. What do you and I have to do, you think? Drive the falls away. You say, there ain't no birds over my head. Yeah, there is. You ever see a bunch of buzzards go after something? That's what he says, falls of the air. That's what he's talking about. Because see, there was dead sacrifices there. So the buzzers, the fowls of the air were coming, and he had to, but we're talking about spiritual fowls. Mm -hmm. They want to disrupt the covenant promises that were made to Abraham that we are participants of, or should I say recipients of. And this is what Galatians chapter 3 talks about, and I go there here recently, they go there back and forth quite often with you. I don't know if you picked up on it, but it's important. The Word of God says in verse 21 of Galatians, and I like the way it says it because a lot of people want to just throw their hands up against the law and say, oh, the law, law. But the law is perfect in itself. Mm -hmm. The law is and was our schoolmaster to lead us to Jesus Christ. And the law in itself is speaking about the feast of the Lord. It's speaking about the sacraments of the temple. All those things pointed to Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God says here in 21 of verse of chapter 3 of Galatians. It says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Verse 22, you are with me. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, our teacher, to bring us to where? Unto uh, Christ. Why? That we might be what? Justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under schoolmaster. Who are we under now? Christ. He is the Lord of our lives. He is the head of his own household. The schoolmaster taught us about Christ when we teach on the feast of the Lord. What are we talking about? We're talking about the uh, sacrifice of Christ through Passover, unleavened bread, and then naturally, we're talking about you have Pentecost, and then you have what? First fruit? What else do you have? <laughs> you got Passover, you got unleavened bread, and you got first fruit. That is the truth. That is the culmination of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice. Pentecost is what happened afterwards, and then naturally you have the fall feast. That is yet to happen. The fall feast is yet, because that represents the second coming of the Lord. It all points to Jesus Christ. When we talk about that, that is the law, but it also applies to us spiritually. It's used the same way to teach us about the coming of the Lord, to teach us about what Christ did, right? Now with all that said, I ask you this. It says, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. And in verse 26, for you, why are we not under a schoolmaster, sister love? It's because we are all the children of God. What? By faith in who? Christ Jesus. Now watch this. For as many of you as have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ. Now, is that meaning that all you have to do is have me dunk you in some water and then you put on Christ? No. That is, is kind of like 
the circumcision that Abraham received after the fact. That's how it's supposed to be represented. The, the baptism is in the heart first, just like the circumcision is in the heart first. The water baptism does not save you. It is a fact after the fact to declare the covenant that God has made with you in Him through Christ. The Bible continues to say it this way. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Born again. Again, he refers back to the same thing that we read in the beginning. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For, all, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to to the promise. Is that what the Word of God says? Okay. What does the Word of God say in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6? The Word of God says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, it says this, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe First of all, what? That he is, and that he is what? A rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Remember what we read in Deuteronomy 28? If you hearken unto his voice, this shall come to pass. He'll reward that. Is that right? Okay. So here, I want you to put down, if you will, your text. You should be able to pick up on where I'm going with all this after all this reading. Your text is found in 2 Peter chapter 1, part B, through verse 5, part A. Second Peter chapter 1, 1B. Through 5 8. Everybody there? This is your text. And this is why I started in the second part of verse 1. This is Peter talking to his group, his people, and he's saying this To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Remember what we read. And Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. Remember what we read in Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 through 29. Remember what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 21. And remember the stumbling block found in 32. Why could they not inhabit the promises of God? It says here, yet in this thing you did not believe the Lord your God. So when we do not inhabit our healing, it's not that you don't believe God, but you don't believe in that promise concerning that healing. Or maybe what it is, is ye of little faith. Not that you don't have faith, but maybe you just haven't been speaking that word to you. Maybe you haven't been owning that word to you. Maybe you've only spoke to you yourself in a particular healing when it got so bad that nothing else would work. Maybe what God wanted you to do was to speak to whatever it is that is contrary to the word of God every time you got up in the morning. Every time you say, well, how long until it comes to pass? Until it, well, Pastor, that might take a long time. Until it comes to pass. Well, Pastor, how am I supposed to do that? Well, the Word of God says that you own it. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Word of God says that we just read in verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. 
the Bible says, to them that have obtained right precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Listen, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things. Now, Pastor, how can I be sure about that? Did we not just read in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, that we are inheritor? That we inherit? Well, look, 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 Pastor, I'm not sure about the world. Listen, let me say something again. Let's go back there a moment and see what we just read. Well, you read a lot, Pastor. Well, what about what you read while I was reading that? Galatians 3, the key verse that you, if you don't want to pay enough attention to anything else, it says, For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. In other words, it's not about the letter of the law. It is about faith for both. There is neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, again, look at your text. According, verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding, say it with me, exceeding great and precious promises. Do you believe that? Amen. Do you speak that to yourself? Amen. Do you speak it just when you're having a hard time? Most of the time that's when we speak the most. What I'm saying is that shouldn't be spoken once it's done. It should be spoken in your prayer life. You should feed yourself. I am healthy. I am of the healed. I like to say that every morning. I am of the healed. I am a healed man. I am a whole man. I'm a man of peace. I'm a man of direction. I'm a man of guidance. I'm a man that's strong. I'm a man that has been set free from the power of darkness. But I speak to myself. I speak to my mind. Mind, what you're thinking about is not of God. Get rid of it. Amen. Pain, get out of my body. Because by his stripes I am healed. Because I live unto righteousness. Well, Pastor, what if it doesn't happen? I'm not worried about when it happens. I know it's going to happen. You see, that's where my faith no longer becomes written on the pages. It becomes stuck in my heart. And the only way it gets out of my heart is when it goes out of my heart into my body. And it's contained. The Word of God says, According as the divine power and given unto us all things that pertain unto what? Life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him that had called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Is sickness corruption to your body? Yes. Is negative thinking corruption to your mind? Yes. Is overeating corruption to your body? Yes. Is doing things that are contrary to the Word of God, corruption to the Word of God in you? Yes. It's not what we think, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not in some big sin of uh, uh, pornography or fornication, adultery. I'm not even talking about that. If you are, shame on you. You need to get on your face while there's yet time. What I'm talking about is what Satan launches against us every day of our lives while we're on the journey of life. And that sickness and disease, that double-minded anxiety, fear, those things bring a child of God down more than anything else does. Faith is not just believing that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. That should be a done thing if you're truly following the Lord. But I'm talking about the real battle is not because you see, you didn't earn your direction to heaven. You didn't earn that gift to heaven. But I want you to know something. Christ paid the price not only for you to leave this earth when the time comes on, but also to walk in health, walk in prosperity, walk in a balanced mind, walk in overcoming, walk as light, walk as, as, as salt. 
Don't you know that, that salt is not just light or holy. It is giving, giving people an alternative to what they're walking in right now. The world says you're sick, you're not going to make it. God says, I've healed you. Well, how can God heal you if you're part of the covenant promises? Well, how can God deliver you if you're part of the covenant promises? But let me tell you something. You can be born again and still crippled. You can be born again and still broken. You can be born again and still poor. You can be born again and still in bondage. How can that be? Because you're not, you're not inhabiting the promises of God. Amen. See, the Word of God says that we can pull down strongholds by bringing into captivity and unto the obedience our thoughts to Jesus Christ. But if you don't do that, no matter what potential, no matter what God has bought, brought for you, bought for you on that cross, you'll never inhabit that until you walk in it. I like to say it this way. If you don't own it, then why should, why should you even talk about it if you don't own it? I mean, why read about something you can't have? You know, I, I read the Word of God because everything in the Word of God says that I can have it. I can have good health. Well, what if you got to fight for it? It makes it even a, a better victory. I told my daughter, I said, let me tell you something. I said, the greater the challenge, the greater the victory. And the more you put a value on that victory. It says this, and besides this, giving all diligence, and that's the word I want you to embrace, diligence. Your theme is this. We can have complete access to God's covenant promises. We can have complete access to God's covenant promises if we will walk in faith. If we will walk in faith, regardless of what we see. We can have God's covenant promises or complete access to God's covenant promises. If we will walk in faith regardless of what we see. There's something here that's interesting that I keep going back to. God keeps on wanting me to sit on for a while. And that's Proverbs 18, 21. And I want to read it to you. I know you've heard it. But you know, you should be tired of reading something that you don't take responsibility for. You know, I believe that everything that God has, has given us, and the Word of God says He's not given us a spirit of fear, power, or love, and a sound mind, but Sister Brooklyn, the Word of God also says He's not given you the spirit of the world, but His spirit, so that you know what might be freely given unto you. But if you don't believe, if you don't own the promises of God, no matter if they're free to you or not, you're not going to have them. The Word of God says in Proverbs 18, 21, it speaks volumes, not so much about one part, but the whole thing read. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We read that all the time, right? How much more for a child of God? How much more for a child of faith? Because you see, I find many believers speaking just as badly is believers. I find many believers doubting the Word of God, or, or better yet, do you not know that you cancel out the Word of God when you, you speak, well, you know, I got this, and I got that, and I got this, and I got that. What you own is because of what you're saying. The Word of God says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What you're receiving more of in your life is what is the abundance of the overflow of your heart. You know, when you say, well, no, wait a minute. No, no, no. You wait a minute. God's Word says that you have the power to choose death and life as a child of God. Now, an unbeliever can't choose death and life. But yet their words are filled and are like containers. They have an impact. But not the same as our words do. Because our words, God says, can move a mountain. Our words, God says, 
we can call forth those things that are not as if they were. Do you know why? Because we've inherited that right in faith to call forth the very thing that God has said shall come to pass. But if you don't call it forth, and I don't mean just when you've got a bobo. I don't mean when things are uncomfortable. I don't mean uh, when, you know, all of a sudden nothing else is working for you. You've got to speak that before. You've got to speak it at every time you look at yourself. You know that you think out of ten thoughts, about nine and three quarters of them, or all about everything that's going on around you or outside of you, but they're very, about a quarter of them might be on God's Word. So what do you think is going to have more life in you? Death or life? Church, it starts with the words of our mouth because they are attached to our hearts. That's what Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 is talking about and verse 25 and 26 of that same chapter as well as Proverbs 4, 20 through 24. I'll read these with you uh, even though we're running a little short of time, I'll read these with you, and then I'll, when I come close to the end, I'll just give them, and you can write them down for your study. Amen? The Word of God says in Proverbs 3, since I'm in Proverbs, 3 verses 5, and we know it again, but do you own it? The Word of God says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And then in verse 25 of that same chapter, in 26, it says, Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. The Word of God says in Proverbs 4, verse 20 through 24, it says, My son, attend to my words, incline thy ear to my sayings, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. Let me back up. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Being in the midst is not in some little side pocket. It's in the very middle. In the midst speaks about the middle. The middle of your heart. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Then it says this, keep thy heart with all what? Diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. A oh, pastor. I don't know about that. I don't, I don't believe God really holds me accountable for those things because, you know, I am a child of faith. I am a child of covenant, but covenant is not automatic. Your salvation may be intact, but that does not mean that your covenant promises are inhabited because every place I see for the covenant promises to be inhabited you and I have a job to do. You have to drive out the inhabitants. And spiritually speaking, we know that's spoken about in Numbers. You have to drive out the inhabitants, which are the enemies to the covenant promises of God, which would be the enemies to your covenant promises through Christ. And those covenant promises, enemies, are not the world. They're not. Because the world doesn't feed your faith. You feed your faith. You feed your faith. Or you don't. Church, living by faith is just what it says. Living by faith. So does it mean that you don't have to have a part to play in this? Are we just to put God's words in our mouth and say what the Bible says? Or speak our favorite memorized words in times of trouble or discomfort or discouragement and then go about our own business living like the world, thinking like the world? No, church. God's covenant promises are all about faith in Christ and the work of the cross of Christ and what it provides for you and I. That's what Isaiah 53 1 says. That's what we say. 
Isaiah 53, 1 says, Whose report shall you believe? We sang, you know, let's take back what the devil has stole. But, you know, we don't understand what the devil has stole is what the work of the cross is in our lives. He's stolen your healing, your promise of health. Did we not read that the word is in your mouth? Did we not read Proverbs 18, 21, what it says there? It says you choose death and life. And whatever you choose, you will eat the fruit of. So if there's doubt in the words that you speak, you're going to eat the fruit of doubt. If there's double-mindedness in the words that you speak, you can read the word perfectly. But when you're reading that word, if you don't own that word, it's just words that you're reading. It falls on deaf pages because it falls on deaf ears. If you don't feed that faith, it will die. It will not stay still. It will die. I'm not saying you'll fall away from the Lord, but I'm saying you will definitely not inhabit the promises of God. How many of you want to be healed in here? Amen. How many of you want to stay healed in here? Amen. How many of you believe that is the covenant promise in your life? Amen. I had somebody tell me, or I heard, I don't know if it's one of the people that, uh, one of my resources, but they said they believed in healing, but only spiritually. And I said, how does that work? I mean, you know, when you're born again, that spirit man is whole. So my spirit man don't need to be healed. My body needs to be healed. My mind needs to be healed. Because those two things, my mind and my body, are still in, stuck in the old man. And my spirit man has got to work out in salvation through my mind and my body. It's got to bring my mind into submission to the word of God. And when I break my mind in submission to the Word of God, it's called transformation. And when I am transformed, my body has to submit and surrender to who's on the throne of my heart. And that's Jesus Christ. Amen. And He says, by my strife, you are healed when you live unto righteousness. Well, what does it mean? Listen, righteousness, Pastor, was imputed to me. Yeah, it was imputed to you for justification. But now you've got to walk out that gift, you gotta walk out that salvation, you gotta walk out the wholeness of it, you gotta walk the journey. Oh, you can trip, you can you can crawl if you want, but not me, baby. I'm excuse the expression, not me. I'm running, okay? I'm running. And if, if there's a hurdle in front of me, guess what? I'm gonna jump it. And if there's a mountain in front of me, I'm going to speak to it. And if that mountain doesn't move, I'm going to keep pushing against it till something happens in me. And it don't matter if that mountain moves or not, because something has worked out in me. Amen. I told my daughter the other day, when I said, honey, I said, you got to understand something. She was talking about this and that and this and that. I believe in this and I have faith in that. And you know where I stand with that. And I told her, I said, but you know something, sis? I said, even with that, I said, when, when uh, the, the, the man with, that was on the pallet and the, and the gate of beautiful, when he looked upon Peter and John, he says, I know, he was looking for some money. But, you know, Peter and John looked at him and said, gold and silver have I not, but I do have unto you. I give unto you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise and be healed. And the thing that you needed, the thing that I wanted her to see, and the thing that I wanted you to notice is the fact that I've said it over and over again. It's not the fact that he jumped up whole and healthy. It's the fact that God knew before that would happen that he needed to heal his ankle bones. There's something that needs to be healed so that you can be whole. Doesn't do any good. To be healed of one thing, just to be attacked by another. Is anybody here for today? That's why I always say this, brothers and sisters, the victory. Christ has won at every level, but we have to walk it out in every level because we're in a hostile world. It's ours, but it's about our faith talk, our faith walk, and our faith stance. Period. You can't have a faith talk without a faith walk. And you can't have a faith talk and a faith walk without a faith stance. Because they go hand in hand. The threefold cord 
is not easily broken. Our part is multifaceted, meaning there are several parts to it. First of all, we have to believe God's Word. 2 Corinthians 4.13 First of all, we have to believe God's Word. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Word of God says, We have in the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Second of all, you need to call forth what God's word says despite of what you see. Romans 4, verses 16 through 25. Thirdly, you need to feed your faith and not your flesh. Hebrews 4, 2. I thought that was interesting because it speaks to what I talked about in, in Deuteronomy. It says here in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 4, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Well, listen. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. It was not mixed with faith. See, you may hear, you may not hear, but the thing is, this: the proof is in the pudding. When it is mixed with faith, something happens. Number four, we need to walk out our faith. How long? Till it comes to pass and then stand your ground. Hebrews 11 and 1, Ephesians 5, 10 through 13. Church, I believe to truly do this, we must self-examine our spiritual lives. And we need to disconnect from anything that contradicts our faith. Anything. Anything that contradicts our faith or weakens our faith. And it's usually our doubt and our double-mindedness through worry and anxiety brought about by fear and also by associations that we keep that are not walking in step with God's Word. You say, yeah, but I've got to have friends. Well, a true friend builds you up. Amen. Doesn't tear you down. A true friend doesn't take away from that which is edifying to you. It wants to be a part of what builds you up so that they can too be built up. So there are some people, even believers, that you associate with that you find after a while you're acting more like them than they are like you. And for some reason your faith was up here yesterday and all of a sudden at the end of the week your faith is not up here. All of a sudden it's here. What happened? The Bible says that evil association corrupts good manners. Who am I speaking here today? To today? You see, you and I either live by faith or we don't. Faith begets faith. I know there are people in here that once started out in a strong step and stance of faith that are no longer, they're kind of skipping. Kind of like doing a little tap dance, you know, like hopscotch when we were kids. But you see, I'm not going to pay for that. And those who are playing with that will. Because you'll eat the fruit of that. You see, you called to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. All throughout the Bible in Habakkuk, throughout the Word of God, it says the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Even before the law. So it has nothing to do with the law. It has everything to do with your heart. God made a covenant with himself that can't be broken with himself. And he will have his remnant people no matter what. Just like he did with Joshua and Caleb. Who will occupy the promised land both spiritually and physically in that order through covenant. And yes, it's through the work of the cross. And the work of the cross worked out in us. That's what Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 16 is all about. 
The cross, what was worked out, the covenant promises must be worked out in you. Everything that Christ did in Isaiah, it says that when he hung on that cross and bore the stripes and the crown of thorns and chastised with his peace, with our peace was on his shoulder, on down the line, we read it over and over again, but until you own it, it's just something you read about. And you can't have one of these things where you just pull it out when you need it because nothing else is working. In this day and age, you need your faith stronger than ever. You need your faith to be multiplied and multifaceted more so than ever. You need the words that you speak of God, God's word, to be your word, calling forth those things as, that are not as if they were because God said so. But the question is, what do you say so? What do you say? The only way you can call forth anything is if your faith does the calling. I believe that with all my heart. Your faith must call, and that means that you and I need to be like Abraham, fully persuaded. Because if faith doesn't rule, flesh will. I know many of you get weary, but this is no time to get weary. This is no time to play hopscotch with your faith. We need to walk it out in thought. We need to walk it out in action. It must be walked out in thought and word in action. The word of God says, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, and that applies to either death or life, faith or flesh, blessing or cursing. So let me ask you, are you still overwhelmed by God's covenant promises or have you forgot to think about them? Or have you settled? You remember when I talked about settling for less? You see, that's what I find many people today doing. They're settling for less. Because to settle for more takes you and I refusing to settle for less. And that takes faith. So let me ask you, do you still believe in God's covenant promises for you? Or have you taken this out because it, you didn't get it yesterday? Or taken this out because you didn't receive it today? Or taken this out, taken this out before long? You've taken out so much of the promises of God that you walk around kind of like the elder son in the prodigal son story. You start to begrudge God. You start to not have joy. For your salvation, you start to, to do, still do all the right things, but you have no joy. <laughs> if you're having a hard time and you're standing in faith or receiving faith in a real productive way, ask yourself, how's my speech been? What's the words I'm speaking concerning my life? Is it covenant or is it something else? Am I living unto righteousness according to the word of God? Righteousness was imputed unto us, but I ask you, are you living unto righteousness? See, by God's grace through faith, am I standing? Have I done all to stand? And again, I say to you, what you're hearing tonight, I can say to you, and I have been saying for years, you can hear what I'm saying and you can think about it or you can do it or you can own it. But if your hearing is not mixed with faith, it won't profit you even though you are saved and even though you are a covenant child of God. You will lack. Isn't that what James 1 says? That no matter what, you will lack because you have doubt. Brothers and sisters, the last reading I'm going to give you is found in James chapter 3. Go there, please. How important is the words that we speak? Well, the words that we speak are attached to our brains 
and they, they are the conduit of our hearts. So it's really in your heart, the more that you have in your heart, whatever you have in your heart, more, and I know that. I've said before, just think if God would play a recording of what you say all day long. Seven days a week. And then he would put before you Proverbs 18, 21. And you say, but Lord God, the covenant promise say this, that, and then he, he lets you listen to your recording. And he'd remind you that in the tongue is the power of life and death. And the fruit, you eat the fruit thereof. And you say, well, Lord, why this and why that? And he says, you're eating the fruit of what you've been speaking. You're eating the fruit of what you've been speaking. The Word of God says this, and the best way to, to give you an analogy of what I'm talking about in closing tonight is this. The Word of God says in chapter 3 of James, verse 10, it says, Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. And then he clarifies that. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? In other words, now, when we talk about fresh water, to me it speaks about life. Salt water doesn't speak about life, right? So I look at this the same way. It says, Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. He's talking about your mouth. The words that you speak. They'll either render salt being that of light, death, excuse me, in this frame, as compared to fresh water being that of life. It says here, can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? And then it goes on to say in verse 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. And of course, the Word of God says in James 2.26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Yes, my brothers and sisters, you may say, well, Pastor, I have the covenant promises. No, they are available. You have access to them. Automatic? No. They are there for you. It cannot be there for you unless you are in Christ Jesus because they come through Christ Jesus. As our text well said, it says, To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, even though we have covenant promises and the covenant promises cannot be limited, they can only be occupied. If you want healing, speak to yourself, I am healed. Say, I am of the healed. If you want peace, I am of the peace. I have a peace in my mind, in my heart. If you have a trouble in your finances, Lord God, I've honored you with all my substance. Therefore, Father God, I have no trouble. I am blessed and overflowing. If there's a problem in a relationship, you say, Lord God, I, I have fidelity in you. I serve you. I lift up you. I honor you. So therefore, I am honored in my relationship. Being of Abraham's seed, brothers and sisters, even though the promise of Abraham to the father of faith that I'm talking about tonight, being of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, and it is, and it was, for Abraham as it is with us, it was in faith, by faith, through faith. We have to walk our covenant promises out. The just shall live by faith. Now there's no other way to look at it, but faith must be alive. Faith must be spoken. Faith must be thought. Faith must be spoken. Faith must be walking. Faith must be stood in. I talked about. It must be, as I've said many times, it must be a living faith in the promises of God. We can't believe and not speak it forth. And we can't mix our faith with doubt or double-mindedness and expect to receive anything from the Lord except His mercy. Church, the qualifier for God's covenant promises to us are if. If you hearken unto His voice. 
if you walk in faith, if you obey in faith, if you speak in faith, if you walk in faith, if you do in faith, if you stand in faith. Faith is not abstract. Faith is alive, for the just shall live by faith. When we hearken to his voice, his people will inhabit these promises. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt that we need to really learn to live by faith, in faith, because the just shall live by faith. Did not God's word say to us that we're justified by faith through the work of the cross? If we're justified by faith, that means the just must live by faith. You can't play with it. Whatever you don't have in your cupboard, whatever you don't have in, in your house, whatever you don't have in your life, is because ye of little faith. Not because you don't have faith, but because you're not watering the faith that you do have. Own what you say. Because you see what you don't realize, when you don't speak God's word, you're owning everything else you say. I close with this. Your word says, Lord, it's the one that Nell and I constantly look at in our kitchen because it says so much. And I bless all of you with this. The psalmist says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. And that's where faith comes in. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Brothers and sisters, when you are moved, it's because you put your right hand on something else and not your faith. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoice. My flesh shall also rest in hope. Verse 11 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life, for in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Father God, I speak that. The just shall live by faith. And faith, Father God, shall have its way. You and I are responsible for what we say, for what we think, and for what we stand in. It's either faith or flesh. And we will eat the food thereof. Father God, I ask that you bless these people tonight, Lord. Keep them and encourage them, strengthen them. And Father God, let them take responsibility. As you call me to own your promises for myself. Speak that word over and over and over and over and over to myself. Speak the peace to myself. Speak the promises of health to myself. Speak, Father God, that I'm strong, not weak. That, Father God, there's a call in my life that will never be satisfied until it's completed. That no enemy, no weapon formed against me will prosper because I'm a servant of the Lord. I speak that unto myself over and over and over again. Because I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, under the shadow of the Almighty, I abide in His Word. And therefore, I say to the Lord, He is my refuge. Father God, bless them as they go home tonight. Bless them in the city, in the country, in their home, in their beds, in their work. The Lord God, let them live by faith. Because, Father, the just shall live by faith. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. Give God all the glory. Amen.